In this lesson, we're going to talk about storage area networks, or SANs. We'll look at what a SAN is and how it works. In a typical server storage configuration, you have a server with a directly attached storage device, like an internal hard disk or a USB attached disk drive. The server shares the files on the device with clients connected to the network. This configuration is relatively inexpensive to implement, but it has some serious drawbacks. For example, suppose the server goes down. If that happens, then these two workstations lose access to the server's shared storage. To create a more resilient system, we can use multiple servers and a SAN. A SAN is a specialized high-speed network that connects hosts with storage devices. When connected to a server through a SAN, a storage device functions just like directly attached storage. The trick with a SAN is that multiple servers can connect to the same shared storage device, and a single server can connect to multiple storage devices. If we implement clustering software on the servers, then they can take over for one another if one of them goes down. On the storage end, we'll choose RAID devices that have multiple disks. This gives us redundant servers and redundant storage. You may have noticed that there are two networks in our example. The first network is our standard production network that connects all of our workstations, file servers, and other hosted services. They're connected by standard Ethernet switches and other common networking devices. The second network is dedicated solely to the storage area network and transfers data between our servers and our shared storage devices. While some SAN implementations use off-the-shelf Ethernet NICs and Ethernet devices common in production networks, you should never mix traffic between your production network and your SAN. SAN components fall into three categories, hosts, storage, and SAN fabric. While the hosts aren't technically a SAN component, they connect to the SAN using a NIC or a host bus adapter. A host bus adapter, an HBA, is a circuit board that's inserted in a server's motherboard, just like a NIC. Storage devices are typically disk arrays, tape libraries, and optical jukeboxes. The SAN fabric consists of the cabling and networking hardware that provides the connectivity between host components and storage components. Typically, the fabric's made up of SAN hubs and SAN switches and the cables that connect them. We use the term fabric for a couple of reasons. Generally, we gain redundancy in our SAN by creating multiple communication paths between our servers and storage devices. This creates a redundant fabric rather than a single thread. Also, using the term fabric helps remind us that our storage area network is different from our production network. There are two dominant SAN technologies, Fiber Channel and Internet Small Computer Systems Interface, or iSCSI. Fiber Channel provides the best performance but requires special purpose Fiber Channel HBAs and Fiber Channel switches. Since iSCSI works with Ethernet switches and physical connections instead of specialized hardware, it's less expensive to implement, but it doesn't perform as well. Fiber Channel can run at speeds up to 128 gigabits per second, whereas iSCSI runs at Ethernet speeds of up to 10 gigabits per second. But as Ethernet speeds increase, so do iSCSI speeds. There are two other SAN technologies being implemented more and more. Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or FCOE, was developed to lower the cost of Fiber Channel solutions. Like iSCSI, it does this by using standard Ethernet switches and physical connections. However, Unlike iSCSI, which can run on slower Ethernets, FCOE requires 10 gigabit Ethernet. There's also InfiniBand, which was designed for high-performance supercomputers. It features high throughput and very low latency. InfiniBand can be used in a SAN or between clustered computers. Regardless of which technology you use, they function in essentially the same way. The production network connects servers to clients, and the SAN connects the servers to the shared storage devices. Now, before we go any further, there are two terms you should be familiar with when working with storage area networks. The first one is a target. All SAN storage devices are called targets. The servers that connect to the shared storage device are called initiators. They run initiator software that connects to and communicates with the SAN target. Whether you're dealing with fiber channel or iSCSI, all storage area networks use a network connection to transfer data between the target and the initiator. Let's take some time to review how the two dominant SANs work, beginning with Fiber Channel. A switched Fiber Channel SAN uses fiber optic cabling, network HBAs, and switches to build the SAN fabric. Let's build a simple Fiber Channel SAN using multiple servers, two Fiber Channel switches, and multiple shared storage devices. First, we'll install two Fiber Channel host bus adapters in each server. 
Next, we'll deploy the two fiber channel switches by connecting each server to each fiber channel switch with fiber optic cabling. For each server, we'll connect one host bus adapter to the first switch and the other host bus adapter to the other switch. Finally, we'll deploy the shared storage devices. In our example, we'll use RAID devices containing multiple hard disk drives and two fiber channel host bus adapters. For each storage device, we'll connect one host bus adapter to the first switch and the other host bus adapter to the second switch. Now we have redundant servers and SAN switches and redundancy is built into our RAID storage devices. An iSCSI SAN uses network protocols that encapsulate SCSI commands within IP packets and transmit them over a standard Ethernet network. iSCSI is less expensive to implement because it uses standard Ethernet hardware to create the SAN fabric. Creating a redundant iSCSI SAN is a lot like creating a fiber channel SAN. First, we'll install two dedicated Ethernet NICs in each server. These NICs can have either fiber or twisted pair connections. Next, we'll deploy the two Ethernet switches. We'll connect each server to each switch using the appropriate fiber optic or twisted pair cabling. For each server, we'll connect one NIC to the first switch and the other NIC to the second switch. Finally, we'll deploy the shared storage devices. We'll use RAID devices with two Ethernet NICs. For each storage device, we'll connect one NIC to the first switch and the other NIC to the second switch. Most Ethernet switches that support gigabit Ethernet are configured with a maximum transmission unit size, or MTU size, of 1500 bytes. This is the maximum allowed by the IEEE 802.3 standard. The MTU specifies the maximum size of the payload in an Ethernet frame. You can increase the performance of an iSCSI or FCOE SAN by allowing jumbo frames, frames with payloads larger than 1500 bytes. The size of jumbo frames varies by vendor and device, but many support payloads as large as 9000 bytes. Since SANs move large amounts of data, they benefit greatly from larger frame sizes. To enable jumbo frames in your SAN, you must change the MTU setting on your servers, your SAN fabric devices, and your storage devices. When you choose a SAN technology, be aware of several factors that may influence your decision. As far as cost goes, you get what you pay for. iSCSI and FCOE are cheaper, but Fiber Channel and InfiniBand perform better. iSCSI and FCOE are easier to implement than Fiber Channel and InfiniBand, which require specialized hardware and knowledge. iSCSI and FCOE are not as fast as Fiber Channel and InfiniBand. However, iSCSI and FCOE speeds increase as Ethernet speeds increase. InfiniBand has a short distance limitation of about 300 meters. Fiber Channel has a distance limitation of 10 kilometers. iSCSI and FCOE can route IP packets over many networks, accommodating longer distances. However, performance is impacted as the longer distances increase latency. Because the servers in a SAN share common storage devices, they're commonly deployed in a clustered configuration. With clustering enabled, multiple SAN servers can be grouped together in a cluster to provide a degree of fault tolerance. Because all of the cluster data exists on the shared storage, there's no need to replicate data between servers. To users on the network, the cluster appears as a single file server. If one of the servers in the cluster goes down, another server immediately takes over to provide access to the files on the shared storage device. This is called a failover, and it usually takes just a second or two to complete. Clustered SAN servers can also be configured to load balance. If the storage provided by the cluster is heavily accessed by network users, it could potentially create a bottleneck and degrade performance. Using a load balancing cluster, the network traffic destined for the shared storage can be divided up and distributed between multiple devices in the cluster. This can dramatically increase the storage system's performance. That's it for this lesson. In this lesson, we talked about storage area networks. We talked about the fiber channel and InfiniBand SAN technologies, which are fast but expensive to implement. We also talked about iSCSI and FCOE SANs, which are slower but less expensive. We talked about the benefits of SANs and how they're implemented, and we talked about enabling jumbo frames for better performance when Ethernet is used. We finished by talking about clustered SAN servers for fault tolerance and load balancing.